Backstage Pass was thrilled to sit down with Kenny Loggins, the king of the movie soundtrack and also the captain of Yacht Rock. He is about to embark on his last and final tour. This is it. Here we go. Sitting down with Kenny Loggins. Well, I mean, it's been an incredible journey for this man right here. What an amazing songwriter and singer and musician. 52 years of touring since 1971. Yeah. This is it. Kenny Loggins. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good to be here. I'm so glad to talk to you today. So this is it. Is it really it? Is it it? Okay. Just making sure. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, getting out from under. It's, uh, you know, being on the road uh, so many years and, you know, it's, it sounds bigger than it is, of course, because um, you know, I, I didn't tour every year. But, you know, in the early years, we would go out for six, seven months, you know, maybe more. Yeah. And or like like the English acts when they come over and they just tour and tour and tour and tour because it's too expensive to go back and forth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when before wives and children, that was how we lived. And then uh, and then that starts to change and then you alter your touring schedule. And, you know, so this year, this year, I'll do about 30 some shows and um, many with the Yacht Rock Review. Yeah, and, good guys. I'm looking forward to it. That should be a lot of fun. It will be a lot of fun. That, that's a great group to bring out on your final tour, kind of riding this uh, yacht rock wave, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think I think it's going to be a very high energy, fun show. I think I last saw you in, I want to say maybe 2014 at the Lyric in Baltimore. Uh -huh. uh, how is your final tour going to be a little bit different for people that are coming out that have seen you before? Well, it's a um, it's a balance between um, the hits. It's not just a hit show. So I, I have the hits in the show, but I also have deeper cuts that represent different periods of my career. And so there'd be maybe you know four or five songs additionally that people uh, aren't expecting to hear. Wow. Quite essential. Like uh, I'm doing Keep the Fire in the show. I haven't done that in many years. Oh one of the, you know, premier songs of that era of my music. So for the hardcore fans there, they'll get a little deeper into the stuff they're used to. That is so much fun. You just did a stint at the Hollywood Bowl with Jim Messina. Mm -hmm. How how did that come about for you guys to kind of get together? Did you already have the idea that the This Is It tour was coming and you wanted to give fans at that Hollywood Bowl just a final look at Loggins and Messina together? No, <laughs> but, okay. but that's a good guess. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, that was the Hollywood Bowl, I think their 100th year uh, in business anniversary. Wow, year. okay. So they were trying to pull in legacy acts that were still together that could represent earlier years for them. Yeah. And, uh, so they, they gave us an offer that, you know, for two nights with my, uh, my solo, of set and then the Loggins and Messina set. And uh, so that was a a lot of work for me. That was, <laughs> I had to go into rehearsals with Jimmy and learn all the L&M stuff all over again. And then, sure. uh, and then of course do my own set. Yeah, I imagine, but that's such a treat for people to be able to see that. Yeah, I, I, I think it, it went over really, really well. And I, I think that the, the legacy part of it is really, is really fun. Was that the first time in a really long time that you guys had performed together? Uh, since uh, 2012, I think. Okay. All right. So a good amount of time. We did a reunion tour in 05 and I think again in, no, it was 08. Yeah. So we yeah. did. The last time we played together as Loggins and Messina was 08. Wow. Take me back to those Loggins and Messina days. Uh, <laughs> to, the, to, the, to the sitting in album. Yeah. Okay. Um, Danny song, Vahivala, 
uh, even had House of Pooh Corner, I think, on side two of that. Talk a little bit about meeting Jim Messina and, and how that came to be for people that might not know. Well, I was, I was, you know, 18, 19, 20, and I was writing like crazy. And I thought, well, I, I want to take a shot at being a solo artist. So I was looking around to see what producers might be out there that I could work with. And I, I love Buffalo Springfield and thought that the sound of that record the last time around was really a great sound. And it was produced and engineered by Jimmy. So uh, I set about trying to find him. And at the same time, my brother was in a and with Columbia Records and his best friend, uh, Don Ellis, became friends with Jimmy Messina. And so yeah. uh, uh, through friendships, you know, Jimmy and I got together. And then also Jimmy was had just made a production deal with Columbia Records mm -hmm. uh, with Clive Davis. So all all forces seemed to come together to bring us together. But originally, when when I started working with Jimmy, um, I considered it, we started as a Kenny Loggins record produced by Jimmy Messina. And then Jimmy got the idea of doing a sitting in thing where he would do a couple of the tunes on the album and be sort of like, it was, in our minds, it was like a jazz kind of tradition that players would sit in with each other for one record and then and then you move on. Then the next record, our plan was that the next record would be a solo album produced by Jimmy. And, um, and that didn't work because Clive didn't want us to break up. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, we, we did that first record, we did sitting in and, and it was so successful so quickly that uh, we agreed to do a six year run. That's amazing. Talk about Vahivala. That's one of my favorite, I gotta say that's one of my favorite songs. Oh, thank you. I, I play it often on my show and um, how did Vahivala come to be? That was just a, an imagination thing, you know, I, I, I saw this character Billy as the, the sort of rebel sailor on, a, you know, ancient, you know, tall, what they call it, tall ships, yeah. you know, and, um, and, you know, they pull into a port somewhere and he jumps ship and goes and parties for all night and then swims back to the boat. <laughs> and we, so I saw it as a character that represented that kind of freedom. And it became one of, I think Jimmy really brought a lot to that song as a producer with, he created the bass line on that song that really mattered to the groove of the tune. Wow. How did you come up with the name Vahivala? It just came out of nowhere. It was so just a made up just thing. Sound, yeah. That's amazing. I see, I, th I think the, the songwriters have the stories because it's really cool for people to hear how these songs come together and they really don't know. It's neat. Yeah, it's just, you know, that was, you know, 19 and, and it was just a, you know, fantasy character. And it's, it's no different than writing a short story or even a book. You know, you're going to have to elaborate, create characters and figure out what they're doing. Let's talk about this fantasy um, for a second. I'm going to ride on that word because I, I feel like uh, Return to Pooh Corner jumping ahead here yeah, yeah. I'm gonna kind of jump all over the place with you but return to Pooh Corner uh -huh. is is such an incredible magical album um that you can listen to it from start to finish and I think it's cool I I, I listened to an interview that you did of of talking about gaining the rights because something you know what you knew somebody it's all about knowing somebody Kenny right so you knew somebody and they were able to give you the permission to include Pooh and Christopher Robin and Eeyore in there. We were, Tell that story of how that came to be. Through one of my best friends, Doug Inglesby, he and I used to play music together. And so he knew the House of Pooh Corner song with me. We would do that just for fun. And he also knew the daughter of the CEO of the Disney Corporation. So he introduced me to Marnie wow. and she introduced me to her father. And her Amazing. father was the CEO of the Disney Corporation. So, yeah. you know, when I originally see when I first got my first real job as a songwriter, uh, I made a hundred bucks a week and I would get my songs heard by going to different parties. And I went to a particular party where there were a couple of guys from the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and they wanted, they loved that Pooh song and they wanted to record it for their Uncle Charlie album. That's but right. when they registered it or something, the Disney lawyers, started to kill it said no we have the copyright on that guy you can't do it 
Yeah. And um, and then that's where Doug came in and said, I got to introduce you to Marty. That's amazing. I'm so glad that that happened, you know, because <laughs> let, let me get a little personal here with, with Return to Pooh Corner from 94. Mm -hmm. um, you had David Pack from Ambrosia, Amy Grant. You had Greg Fillingains. Not a lot of people know about Greg Fillingains. If you don't, you should. Greg Fillingains with Lazy Nina. He was on Return to Pooh Corner. I had infertility issues and I couldn't get pregnant. And then I ended up doing in vitro and had twin girls. Mm -hmm. And when they both were able to come home, one was in the NICU, I put Return to Pooh Corner on, on loop huh. for months. So people would come and visit and then they come visit a month later and they're like, you're still playing Return to Pooh Corner. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. So my babies were pretty much into the musical world with Return to Pooh Corner. It is such a magical, beautiful, brilliant album. I talk about it because some people that haven't heard it should really listen to it. And it's not just for children. Like as an adult, I absolutely love this album. And you get kind of transformed. Was, was the premise of doing this album and going back to almost these like childhood fantasies and, and, and magical realms, how was it making this album and getting into that headspace? Uh, it was pretty easy to do. I, I had been noticing that uh, uh, I, I had the job of putting my third child to bed most nights when, I, especially of course, when I was home. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it was at that time, it was Bella and a bottle. And I would, I bought a rocking chair and I would be in the chair with her and I would start singing whatever came to my mind. And I noticed that I was singing a lot of songs that weren't necessarily traditional children's songs. And uh, after a while, I, I had a kind of a repertoire. And, you know, I was doing John Lennon's Love Is, and I was doing um, um, a couple of Jimmy Webb songs and, you know, they let last unicorn and stuff. And I thought, God, there are great children's songs out there that mm -hmm. were written by real songwriters. Yeah. And, um, and then you think about the movie songs and those were all the Disney movies had great songs. You pick, and I had Beauty and the Beast, which I put on the, the second record. Um, you know, um, so I had this repertoire and, and I remember thinking somebody should make a record that, for children that the parents could love as much as the children. Yeah. Because usually children's records are the sort of thing that my friend of mine used to say, we give them flying lessons. You take the CD and you fly it off the front porch. <laughs> listening. And, uh, you know, I, I thought, well, I wish somebody would do that. And it dawned on me that it should probably be me. And that was when my, uh, my second wife was pregnant with my fourth child, Luke. And during the pregnancy, I thought, now's the time for me to really drop into this. Yeah. And, and it worked really well. It was really, uh, the premise worked because there were so many great songs out there that I could pick from. And, the, and for me, production wise, I just wanted to keep it real simple, not necessarily guitar voice, have it be an adult level production. We're, we're spending real money on the record to try and make a beautiful sounding record. But at the same time, don't overdo it. Keep it simple, keep it clean. I found that if I was really trying to make a record that babies and parents would want to fall asleep to, it probably shouldn't have drums. So we started with the premise of, you know, take the drums out, oh. percussion, minimal instrumentation, and see what the song really absolutely needed. And that's that's how it's so it's such a peaceful record. My daughter went off to college, and she took the record with her because you know homesickness. She would play the record. You know, it was calming for her. Okay, well, mine are leaving for college in two years. So thank you. Now I know what to give them when they go off to college and leave me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll have to play it myself. To Ralura and uh, all the pretty little ponies and Rainbow Connection and Neverland. Just brilliant. So if you've not heard that album, go out and get it because it's incredible. Thank you. If, if Michael McDonald is the, and I sat with Mike, I called him this. If Michael McDonald is the godfather of Yacht Rock, what is Kenny Loggins to Yacht Rock? They have been calling me the captain. The captain. I like it. 
Yeah, which it's just it's pretty, you know, if you're going to be involved in Yacht Rock, you should be one of the captains. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. Well, then we'll have to bump him from Godfather to Captain 2, and you two can be the captains of Yacht Rock and rule the world. What, okay. is, what was it like working with Michael and uh, and and writing? I, I heard his experience uh, working with you, and of course, he has nothing but wonderful things to say. Uh, what was the experience like uh, writing with Mike? I love writing with Michael and always have, but we're both shy people, and we tend to not push the boundaries on that. We prob probably should give it another shot before we're totally done. But uh, Yes, please. Um, the last thing we wrote together was a song called It's About Time, which I'm now performing. It'll be in the show as the Ooh. probably second or third song in the show. And, you know, very few people have heard it because it's, you know, after that whole wave of when he and I were writing Grammy songs. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, no, it's uh, Michael has a, a very unique, specific wheelhouse that he works in that is his style. And so to successfully collaborate with Michael, I have to meet him in his world and, uh, and pretty much try to go into that. If I was Michael, what would I, what would I do next? So we bounce ideas off each other really fast, you know, and when he, when he moves into a groove, I might hear in my imagination, what I think the next thing would be that he would do. And then I'll sing that at him and then he'll go, oh yeah, yeah. What if I do this and you know, put these chords on it? You know, so it's very quick. Like a, yeah. Speed dating version. <laughs> <laughs> I always would say when people would ask me, if you could go back in time, where would you go? And I always have the same answer. I would go back to the studio or I would go to the studio, not back because I was never there. I would go to the studio when you guys were doing We Are the World ah. and be in that room and just observe. Yeah. Huey Lewis put on Instagram, I guess maybe a month or two ago, some some behind the scenes footage oh. of him. You got to go on his Instagram page. It's still on there, the video. Mm -hmm. And there you are sitting with Steve Perry in the background on the steps, watching Huey do his part. Uh -huh. I always thought, you know, that must have been an experience unlike any other. Can you go back in time right now for me to We Are the World and, and maybe give a little bit of some behind the scenes yourself? Yeah. What it was like? It was, it was unique for all of us because nothing like that had happened before it and very very rarely do things come together of that scale um, i think quincy did a, a follow-up to we are the world 20 or 30 years later mm -hmm. but yeah. um, but uh, I, I don't think we really fully grokked what it's it's seen in hindsight differently than it was when we were there excuse me because we were all still very much active, struggling, working very hard to either create or maintain our careers. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and it was for us also kind of surreal because we knew each other only professionally or from the, like Paul Simon, of course, I knew Simon and Garfunkel, I knew the records, but I'd never met Paul. And, um, and he was sort of in that rarefied stratosphere Springsteen had one leg in it and uh, uh, Stevie Wonder definitely was in it and um, we were all sort of nudging up against it and and um, in that way we we recognized the the potential for the legacy of that record we are the world and um, but it was mostly just really fun to be in the room recording with people whose voices we loved and you know, so we're all essentially fans of each other's work. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I saw a, a thing on YouTube of, of um, Cindy Lauper struggling to get her line and Steve Perry coaching her from the steps behind her. And oh, wow. like this, you know, 
because it was like two or three in the morning by then and we were all exhausted I'm really sure each one of us would get our line right the first or second time and uh, cindy was was classic because she really was the Cindy Lauper that we heard on the on the radio was that girl on stage, you know, on, on, on that microphone and trying to find her, her character, Daryl Hall trying to find his character where he would do his signature licks and stuff. It, sure. was, it was fun in that way. I'm so glad that you were involved in that project. And I think it's just going to be one of those staples throughout history. Just I don't think anything has really been like that, which yeah. then leads me to Live Aid. You got to perform Footloose at, at in Philly at Live Aid in '85, I believe yeah. it was. Right was that the biggest? Before. Was that the biggest audience that you've had to date? Was Live Aid? I'm sure, yeah. And there was also a simulcast audience on that because those were the early days of that sort of thing. Right. And, uh, so there was a whole European audience watching simultaneously, but probably at three in the morning or something. Mm -hmm. uh, it was. Uh, um, that was kind of a, a zoo, um, not the same vibe as We Are The World. We Are The World had a, like Quincy's sign, leave your ego at the door. Um, that was not the case for Live Aid. Everybody brought their security guards and their roadies and their, you know, entourage. And then they had separate quarters and nobody, there was very little mingling going on. And it was, a, you know, the, Everyone knew they were there because it was a benefit, obviously. So they were there of their own volition, but it was also a star making moment. And, you know, people were hoping that it would be kind of like what happened to the acts that played Woodstock would maybe take off out of Live Aid. I was on tour and I happened to have that day off in my schedule. So we just took the band and flew from wherever we were. I don't remember where we were, but it wasn't that far away a couple hour flight to come into Philly and do that show and then jump on the plane and go back to where the next show was, you know, so it was a bit of a rush, but it was all part of that same vibe for me that we are the world Bob Geldof kind of moment. Sure. Pretty amazing. Well, captain of Yacht Rock, <laughs> king of the soundtrack. Yeah. I mean, um, Caddyshack one and two, Top Gun, Footloose, Over the Top, One Fine Day. I love uh, for the first time, by the way, from 96. Uh, uh, that was, I, I found that song absolutely brilliant and beautiful. Um, personal, personal fan of that. <laughs> I can't take credit for uh, for the first time. That was not written by me, but I got lucky. Don Einer, who was the president of Columbia Records at the time, sent it to me. He yeah. Said, you must sing this song. It's It's perfect for you. It is exactly, it was like made for your voice. That's exactly right. It was just perfect. Your vocals on that were in incredibly beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So talk about Caddyshack. I mean, it started with Caddyshack and then you kind of didn't mean to become the king of the soundtrack of the eighties, but you, you kind of did. <laughs> Wait, it's one of those things you just sort of fall into. I was, uh, I, had worked with Barbara Streisand and John Peters on Star is Born, on her version. Mm -hmm. And in the process, I became friends with John. And then when John and Barbara broke up, he started his own production company. And the first thing he made wisely was Caddyshack. And he used all the National Lampoon people. And um, so he called me up and said, hey, I want you to see my movie. <laughs> it was like, like kids, right? I made a movie. Come on down and see it. So I went to his studio and I watched the movie and it didn't have an ending yet. And it didn't have the gophers and the animation stuff, but it was uh, funny as hell. And, and Bill Murray and Chevy Chase were hilarious. And I just was discovering Rodney Dangerfield. I'd never known about him before, but it was like, for me, it was like, I want to write every song in this movie. And so he gave me like four songs in the movie. And um, of course, I'm All Right was the premier one. Right, right. And then coming back, you know, with Nobody's Fool for Caddyshack 2. Yeah, but that was that was years later. That was years later. I play that on my show all the time. I love Nobody's Fool. I think it's oh, awesome. <laughs> that was my foreigner song. You know, we we wanted to write something in that vein that would be sort of that kind of rock and roll. With yeah. Real, I'm going all the way. Oh, it's so fun. 
In the it's hernia. so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, talk about Footloose a little bit because that ended up taking off and skyrocketing. Everybody is obsessed with Footloose and everybody knows Footloose. Yeah. Uh, even kids today, even my kids know Footloose. It might so, be a school play. <laughs> right. um, that Dean Pitchford wrote Footloose and Dean and Dean and I had written songs together. He is a lyricist. Okay. And so he came to me with his screenplay in his hand and said, would you read my screenplay? Uh, I need to write some songs for it. So as a favor to Dean, I read the screenplay and then we sat down and we wrote a couple of songs for it. But we were writing to the screenplay, which has never happened before or since for for me. You know, right. that may happen now and then, but for a musical, um, maybe it's more common to have the music in the bag before they start filming, but most movies don't do that. Wow. I think that's part of why the, the movie came out <clears> so, <throat> so powerful, because uh, they were dancing to the real music. That doesn't happen very often. Yeah. That's amazing. Amazing. And then now... They just released Top Gun Maverick last year. Use your song again. Yeah, How'd that feel? That felt great. I mean, you know, <clears throat> what, what are they? I figured they probably want to re-record it at the very least. You know, I suggested uh, re recording it, me and Foo Fighters. And Grohl was considering that. Oh, wow. The last message I got from Tom Cruise was, we want it exactly as it was. Yeah, I had to do a, a 4.0 version, which, you know, with all the surround sound that exists in the theaters. And he said, no, I don't want it modernized. I, I want the original version because he wanted to conjure up the vibe of the first movie, which is exactly what he did. And it worked like a charm. I, I have to agree with that because sitting in the theater, I took my girls and it really just, yeah, it was nostalgic. I mean, that's the word for it, nostalgic, because you still want some of that from the original. And then um, playing with the boys also was used was, as- Was not in the new one. It was no. not in the new one, okay. I tried though, I, I actually re-recorded it with an Australian punk rock female named Butterfly Boucher. And <laughs> she wrote some stuff addition to it. Wow. It was a duet. It's uh, on my website for sure. Kennyloggins.com if you wanna hear that. Yeah, it really came out great. I thought she added some really interesting chords to it and, and an interesting personality. Yeah. Amazing. It's unbelievable. Um, talk a little bit about going back out on tour. Uh, I just talked a few weeks ago with your vocal coach, Ken Stacy, oh, nice. who is a lovely, lovely man. I love him so. Um, okay. You know, people don't really think that, you know, you, you tune a guitar, you tune the drum kit, you tune the piano, you got to keep tuning the vocal cords. Um, how, how are you doing? And, and are you, uh, you know, I talked to him a little bit about it and got his take. And he yep. says, you are, you are raring to go. You're very excited to hit the road and, and be on that stage. He's how are you doing? Me. He's helped me tremendously. Uh, and when 2020 hit and we weren't working, everything started to atrophy. And before long, I could barely hit the notes in Danny's song. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I've either got to retire or do something about this. And uh, so I called up a friend of mine and said, do you know any great vocal coaches? And he said, well, I know opera coaches, but what you need is Ken Stacy, who bridges the gap between the bel canto opera method and pop music. And he sings in ambrosia as well from time to time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, so I called him up and we've been working at first for about three months. We worked five days a week and now we work three days a week. Um, and um, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And now that we're moving into the time where I'm going to be working a lot, I'm going to go back to five days a week because I need, I need to, I'm, I just had a, a breakthrough moment with Ken just three days ago. And, and all of a sudden, some vocal stuff started to happen that I haven't had in years. But he, my range in the 80s, my best range was a B flat, my highest full voice note. Mm -hmm. And now he's, he's got me up to a C sharp. So, wow. So that's just a, that's a big deal for me to be able to sing those high notes now. I'm sure. That's amazing. The main thing is stamina. 
I was trying to do a, a, a um, 120 hour show and meaning two hours. And I just, my stamina, my, my physical thing, I couldn't do it. I couldn't maintain that center, that strong, mm -hmm. to be able to go. You got to be 25 to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, this is maybe a little bit overachieving. I'll go back to a 90 minute show. But do you have a do you have a set set list or do you mix it up and change and add and take away throughout hope, your tour? My hope is to do that. Um, it's difficult to keep all the songs in shape, you know, because the next thing you know, oh, I want to call off you know, leap of faith. Uh, well, we've kind of forgotten how that goes. <laughs> we got to play it at sound check and make sure we still know how to do it. And the lighting designer may not have cues on that yet. You know, because hard to to really have the the sound guy and the lighting guy up to speed on that much music. But I'm trying. We'll probably have it you know, within a week or two. Because I did take a little sneak peek. See, now with social media and now with the internet and keep all these websites, you can take a sneak peek at set lists and see what you played you know, last night's concert two nights ago. And so I was just kind of sneaking and looking and, and seeing what you were covering. And it's a very nice wide array of, of hits and your deep tracks, like you said. Um, but people, you know, I don't want people to be disappointed if they go and they're like, well, you didn't play this song and you play this because like you're saying, you can't cover them all. It's hard. Yeah. Thank God. But at the same time, I, I think I'm, I'm covering everything that somebody will, 98% of the songs that people would come for. I think I've got them. When you look out into that audience, do you see a, a younger generation starting to come in and appreciate maybe because of this new Top Gun that was released? Or do you see uh, faces that, you know, you used to see in the 80s and 90s? Yeah, I think it's it's mostly um, older folks, but mm -hmm. not, not necessarily just the throwbacks to my era, um, it was probably more the, the movie songs that caught the biggest public attention. Um, and so the, my biggest audience will be from that period, uh, probably in their late 40s to late 50s. Wow. Well, this is going to be an incredible tour. Yeah. I'm sure that you're going to enjoy going city to city and seeing all these amazing fans and giving them that that one last shot. And you're not done musically. You, you've already, you know, said publicly that you plan on still writing and and creating albums, but you just the touring aspect. It's it's very tiring. I understand. Again, 52. Kudos to you. 52 years. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, that's that's a career I never expected to have. I remember when I met Jimmy Messina. Jimmy told me, yeah, I've been on the road for six years. And I remember thinking, God, I could never do that. <laughs> six years is like a blink in the eye now. <laughs> but, you know, you keep going. I think what somebody said, why, why did you tour for so long? I said, well, two marriages, two divorces, five children, four grandchildren. Uh, on it goes, right? It's so just go to work, do what you got to do. You've been able to write with some of the biggest people out there and duet with so many amazing people. Is there somebody that you haven't worked with that you really would like to? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting question. I haven't been asked that question in a long time. Um, I, there, have been, there have been a couple of young, you know what Elton did recently with um, uh, Dua, Dua Lipa. Lipa. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I like that idea. And I think that I would love to work with a younger artist who maybe credits me as some level of influence that um, mm. we could do right together or do a duet together while I still have my chops you know, because <laughs> God knows how long that's going to last. That would be amazing. It'd be fun. And that, that's the kind of thing that gets the, the juices flowing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's an interesting answer. I was not expecting you to go that route, but I'm glad you did because I think that would be, I think that would be very cool to hear you with uh, somebody. Well, I want to ask you a question. Um, which of the Yacht Rock Review artists does, which does, which do, which does my, my songs? 
which sings which which singer sings the kenny songs um yacht rock review mm-hmm. from yacht rock review yeah i think it would be well nick i think would sing your used to sing your songs but i, I asked them they can't they can't do a kenny song when they're opening for you yeah they can that's the thing is i i think i think um there may be i heard them do one that mike and i did called gotta try yeah that well, i'm not doing that song so maybe maybe they should do it well tell them <laughs> they, i said are you able to do a kenny song since you're opening for kenny and they're like no i <laughs> said well are you going to be on stage with him and you guys do something together and they're like can you put a good word in so huh. putting a good word in yeah yeah <laughs> well, the main thing i'm concerned about is energy yeah I, I thought about yeah it'd be really fun to go out there and maybe they could create a medley and it'd be sort of like what, what what plays do at the beginning of a play where they do little bits and pieces of the songs in the play yeah maybe do that kind of a medley and but i just don't know if, if i'm going to have the physical energy for you know that many that that much singing in one night right yeah but right maybe, maybe i could bring their lead singer into my show and we could do one of my songs as a duet. Yeah, it's a, bring Nick and Peter. Yeah. Bring them both on there, and, and yeah, and 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 do that. And then you got get a, get a stool and sit down. And which one does the Mike the Mike McDonald songs? Oh, I think I think Nick, Peter, and I think maybe Greg may have, may have done a one that sounds the most like Michael. Uh, you don't know me, but yeah, uh, no, I did. Good. <laughs> I'll come on. Okay, I'll come on stage on June fifteenth at Wolf Trap, and I'll do the Mike on the double part. I actually did that for Mike. Um, let me ask you one more question, and then I, and then I'm going to talk to you after this. Um, I always wrap up the interview asking people, "What is your best goosey moment?" Meaning that you get goosebumps all up and down your arms, and you're going, "I can't believe this is my life right now. This is amazing." Oh, now am I limited to, uh, um, well, uh, am I limited to my music or what, what, what form? Anything. If you've met somebody or you were, you know, on a stage somewhere, anything, what was your best goosey? Um, well, there's, there's any number of, I mean, I had this the Sunday with my kids and my grandkids at, at home. And that there's, those are those moments where, you know, my Lisa, my gal has been with me now, we're together for five years and she's stepped into the role of grandma. And there's, Aww. there's a real goosey moment in that. But uh, on stage for me, it's when I do a song that really, really mattered to me when I wrote it, whether it, whether it was something that was comforting myself during a difficult time like real thing from leap of faith um it, it all depends on the the vibe of the audience the energy that's what's taking place at that time um and uh and then often i if, if i get too choked up on something i have to really focus on singing it on pitch if i really focus on the pitch i forget about the stuff that's getting me you know goosey as you put it goosey that's a good goosey, Kenny Loggins. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Don't go anywhere. Thank you so much. Okay.